Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of the New York Stock Exchange. Very big slogan. I wonder if you've ever heard it. The world puts its stock in us. Located just a half a block right up the road here in the financial capital of the world at 60 Broad Street. We're at 50 Broad. Nothing like that big New York Stock Exchange. More than 3,000 securities that are listed on that exchange. If you took the hundreds of millions of shares that are outstanding for those 3,000 approximate companies that are listed on the big board, and you multiplied those hundreds of millions of shares by their average price per share, which, by the way, would be the mathematical formula to place a valuation on any exchange, I would tell you it's close to $6 trillion. And that includes the loss of about a trillion and a half that we experienced a little while back as a result of the collapse of the real estate market that sent shockwaves to the equity market. Are you with me so far? Yeah. You know, before we start to trade uh, with the New York Stock Exchange and go to NASDAQ, I thought I'd give you some history about the New York Stock Exchange because I got a lot of that for you. Give you an idea and a good sense of your location. Most expensive stock in the world is listed on the New York Stock Exchange in the world. Berkshire Hathaway, Burke A, about 138000 a share. Warren Buffett, $138,000 for one share. Wow. That's a wow. And I'm not talking about that IOS commercial. You know what? When we look at the New York Stock Exchange, we want to get an idea of how it was formed because you should have a sense of history because we're talking history here. I don't want to talk to you about right in front of the New York Stock Exchange. There used to be a tree. This is a very famous tree in this industry. It's not there anymore, obviously. Uh, but this tree was called a buttonwood tree. Listen to me carefully. In 1792, a group of commodity brokers got together around that tree uh, and began the trading of commodities. So I'm telling you that the predecessor to the formation of the New York Stock Exchange was commodity trading first. Are you with me? Yes. And then in uh, 1792, they signed this agreement at this, tr uh, at this tree called the Buttonwood Agreement, uh, which began the formation of the New York Stock Exchange, and then they brought it in that building, and that was the beginning of the big boards trading. Are you with me so far? Yes. When you go into the New York Stock Exchange, and visitors during tourist season, which just recently ended, uh, would get tickets to come on down here to take a look at a sense of history and culture, because history and culture is down here. You have uh, the... George Washington headquarters at uh, Fonces Tavern. You know about that restaurant? It's the oldest restaurant in the United States. It's right down here on Water Street, where a gentleman by the name of Fonts uh, headquartered Washington. It's the George Washington Museum on the other side of this restaurant, where he, uh, on the balcony, George Washington waved to his troops when they were ready, get ready to go to Valley Forge. Are you with me so far? We have a lot of history down here. Uh, but I want you to know that so some of these buildings down here are very historical. The Tourists used to go, still do go, although t tickets are limited to the New York Stock Exchange. And when you walk into 60 Broad, uh, the very first thing you see is a six-foot black-and-white photograph of the Buttonwood tree, because that was the beginning of the formation of the New York Stock Exchange. Then there's the CNN booth that reports the market updates and its pricings every 15 minutes uh, throughout the trading day. Uh, and then, of course, you get onto a galley, and that galley overlooks the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And narration is in about eight major languages from people who come from all over the world to explain what's happening on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, to people from all over the world. Are you with me so far? Yes. If you look down at that visitor's, uh, from that visitor's galley overlooking the floor of the exchange, you can determine the players that you read about last night by the colors of their jackets. Are you with me so far? Yes. You've got the uh, individual who's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange known as the specialist. Every stock is assigned a trading post. At that trading post is that trading crowd. On one side of that trading crowd are people who are bidding for that stock. On the other side of that trading crowd are people who are putting that stock out there at the offer. Now, the individual who is in the middle of that trading crowd, who maintains stock price equilibrium, who has the responsibility of matching the orders between buyers and sellers to ensure that that stock doesn't fly too high or crack too low from its average trading range, which is what it's meant by maintaining stock price equilibrium, is known as seven, the specialist in the stock. He's the market maker in the stock. He is acting in this principal role. In this principal role, he's matching the orders between buyers and sellers to maintain stock price equilibrium. And if he's acting in a principal capacity with me so far, yes. what transactional fee will he charge his trading crowd? A mark up above the offer or a mark down below the bid when matching those orders. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, I got to tell you, 
that there is a lot of activity that goes on on the floor. Hundreds of millions of dollars, look at me, are traded by the nanosecond. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Average trading volume, 1.678 billion shares traded a day. Broke the trading record of more than 3 billion shares in one trading session six times. The New York Stock Exchange right now is known as a hybrid exchange. What does that mean? Well, it has always been for 215 years of trading. Are you with me so far? Yes. We've been trading almost as uh, old as this young country. Are you with me so far? Yes. An auction market. Give me a bid. Give me an offer. Done, done. That auction market outcry system. Are you with me so far? Yes. A two-sided auction market. But then a while back, the New York Stock Exchange put into the exchange Archipelagio. Listen to me carefully. Archipelagio, look at me, is an electronic institutional program trading system of execution. Electronic. So that means that part of the exchange is electronic now. Are you with me so far? Yes. And part of the exchange is an auction market. That's what it's meant by being a hybrid exchange. It's a combination of the auction market and an electronic marketplace. Are you with me so far? Yes. What's happening? Well, I'll tell you what's happening and what's going to happen um, over the next several years. The New York Stock Exchange will ultimately be completely electronic, and they will eliminate the auction portion of this hybrid part of the New York Stock Exchange. The question is why? And the answer is simple. An auction market is too slow to compete on the global electronic market scale. Are you with me so far? Yes. It will be fully electronic. <laughs> now, I want to talk to you about um, the players that are on the floor. How many seats are there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? Do you know? 1,366, and not building any more. What's the waiting list to get a seat in order to trade on the floor? It's a century. You're not getting one. Well, there's only one other way to uh, get on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and that is to what they call today license a seat and own a licensee agreement. Are you with me so far? Yes. From an owner. How much does that cost? About $330,000 a year annually. And then when you get on the floor, uh, before you even execute one share, one order, you must subscribe to New York Stock Exchange Trading Systems of Execution. Brass, Archipelagio. That could be a good five, six thousand dollars a month. Why, if you don't have a business, you'd be out of business before you even got on the floor. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, we see that electronic execution has really disposed uh, what uh, human people could normally do. And that's why I could remember the days in the 79s and the 80s where there were more than a thousand people on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Right now you might see only a couple of hundred. Where was the American Stock Exchange? I said was, because it was its Trinity Place. Are you with me so far? Yeah. 71 Trinity Place. The lease was up not too long ago. And last year, where did the New York Stock Exchange go? They moved into the back room of the New York Stock Exchange. So part of the New York Stock Exchange is the Amex, and the other part is the New York Stock Exchange. The Amex has moved into where the New York Stock Exchange is in the back room. What's the American Stock Exchange? Fully derivative trading on the options side. Are you with me so far? Yes. Why? For more cost-effective and cheaper rents. Are you with me so far? So they've consolidated. Even though it's a different exchange, it's part of and in that location. Are you with me so far? Yes. So that location now is the combination of the New York Stock Exchange and part of the New York Stock Exchange is Amex. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, when you look at the trading firms that are on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the oldest member firm, listen to me carefully, is Henderson Brothers. The one firm on Wall Street that trains all of the specialists to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is Rob Peck McCooey. You know, I say these names to you, they really don't mean anything. I literally have chills when I say the names. Are you with me so far? Because they're down here for more than a century. I'm talking about big institutions. J.B. Hanauer, Rob Peck, these firms are legendary. It's an exciting place. I spent many years on that floor when I started out in the business at 17. I'm 53. I've never left this business. Forgive me, I'm a little bit of a dinosaur. And I just want to tell you what my job was and my role was. I was a runner. And a runner was someone who, that when a specialist looked at and said, hey, kid, go get coffee and cigarettes. Boy, did I run. I didn't know what was going on around here. I said, this place is out of control, uh, but I'm not leaving until I get a piece of this, you know, because it was really exciting to me. But what did I know? The next year, I became head runner. So when the specialist looked at me and said, hey, kid, go get coffee and cigarettes, I said, you heard him. I kind of felt like I had this sense of power going on. You know, across from the New York Stock Exchange's visitor's galley, if you overlook the floor, there's another galley. I want to tell you what that galley is on the other side of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's for members only. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, uh, at that time when the New York Stock Exchange was originally formed, after the predecessor to the exchange, which was commodities trading in 1792, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange was the largest exchange in the United States, with Philadelphia being the oldest city. Are you with me so far? Yes. 
But then I gotta tell you about Manhattan. Manhattan's a fascinating city because it's a port city, as you know, right on the Hudson. We built the Erie Canal. And when the Erie Canal was formed and completed, a tremendous amount of trade got imported into the, uh, into the port city of the borough of Manhattan. And it only took three years after the completion of the Erie Canal for the New York Stock Exchange to overtake the Amer Philadelphia Stock Exchange to become the largest exchange in the United States. And today, the largest exchange in the world. In the world. I'm talking global. These companies are so liquid, they're as liquid as the ocean. And they're all global and multinational in scope. You with me? Yes. I think we got a little bit of a good feeling for our location. The minimum market capitalization of these companies in order to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange is $40 million. You're dealing with some of the most profitable companies in the world. And um, the qualification that companies must meet in order to be listed as a Dow 30 component is even, even at a higher level of our blue chips of some of the most powerful uh, companies in the world. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Nickname for the floor, the jungle. Blue room, green room, main room. And again, every stock is assigned a trading post and at that trading post is that trading crowd uh, and the specialist who's the market maker in the stock. Are you with me so far? So we talk about the specialist, but I want to talk to you also about the uh, commission house broker. He's somebody that you read about last night as well. I'm on the floor. I work for Goldman Sachs, Dominic and Dominic, these institutions, member firms. I am the floor broker, the commission house broker for Goldman Sachs. And I have these telephone wires. Are you with me so far? Though today everything is fully automated. When I pick up these wires, or orders are coming into me from my trading department of my member firm that I am the floor broker of. Are you with me so far? And these orders are coming into me in rapid fire. Buy, sell, write up the ticket through electronic execution. It gets executed to the post where the stock is assigned in 17 seconds. That trade is then reported to the consolidated ticker. By whom? A floor trade reporter. Are you with me so far? Yes. Sometimes. The commission house broker, the floor broker, gets overwhelmed at to the speed that these orders come into him. So he doesn't get backed up. I want to tell you what he can do. Watch me carefully. He can hand off some of these orders to a $2 broker. He's another individual that you read about last night. Now, the $2 broker is an independent agent on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. He can execute for any floor broker, commission house broker, when the commission house broker hands off orders over to the $2 broker uh, because of the speed and the rapid fire within which the orders are coming into him. Are you with me so far? Yes. So if the $2 broker is representing the floor broker and executing for the floor broker when the floor broker gets overwhelmed, are you with me so far? Yes. Then uh, what transactional fee do you think the $2 broker is going to charge the floor broker? He's going to charge Series 7 a commission because he's acting for him in an agency capacity as an agent to execute for the floor broker. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let's talk about that name, though, because that name is historical as well. The $2 broker, more than 100 years ago, got that name. You want to know why? Uh, because he used to make two bucks for every round lot he executed for a floor broker. Are you with me so far? Yes. I assure you he's not making $2 for every round lot he executes today. But we don't like to change much today tradition in this industry. We like to kind of keep a uh, certain tradition intact. And so he still has that name. Are you with me so far? Yes. You read about the floor trader. He trades his own money. Therefore, he has a licensee agreement or he owns a, a seat on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for his own trading account proprietarily every single day. Are you with me so far? Yes. You didn't read about the floor governor. He's an individual on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that handles arbitration for transactions that might have been forced to arbitration right on the floor. And so these are some of the players that you read about associated with your location, but just a little bit more glamour before I start trading with you in rapid fire. I want to talk to you about um, a private club that is in the penthouse of the New York Stock Exchange. Now you've got to pay dues in order to be a member of this private club. Who belongs to this club? All of the $2 brokers, floor brokers, anyone of significant value uh, that has this private club that they go to that work on the exchange. Are you with me so far? Yes. Every morning at 6.30 a.m. until 8.30, they have a breakfast buffet. This is called a power breakfast, a million-dollar breakfast club. Are you with me so far? Yes. Where they're uh, being served in Wall Street traditional white glove treatment with chafing dishes, sterling silver chafing dishes, a buffet that's only been rivaled like some of the buffets you might have seen in Vegas or Atlantic City if you've ever been to uh, some of those brunches. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's absolutely fabulous with carving stations. It's really magnificent. Uh, and um, they're serving it all. And I want to tell you that the players that are on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that belong to this private club are having breakfast and they're talking at this breakfast about what's about to happen on the floor today regarding certain specialists or floor brokers or floor traders who have certain significant, significant and sizable orders that could swing the performance of the overall Dow. Are you with me so far? Yes. I mean, these people are moving and shaking and, and, and trading significant positions. Are you with me? Yes. 
Now, I have a deal that I want to offer you. Crash, you know how I feel about you. That deal stands for everyone. And you don't have to accept this offer, this deal, but I'm going to offer it to you anyway. I always wanted your first day on Wall Street to be one of the most magnificent days you could ever really remember. And that would be, of course, the day that you got licensed. Uh, and hopefully you can turn out to be Wall Street's next million dollar producer. Or maybe the biggest bust out we've ever seen. But the bottom line is I wanted this day to be a day that you would never forget. Besides the fact that you passed your license on the first shot I play to win. So I have a deal I'd like to offer you. Uh, and that would be that the day after you pass the seven, I would like you to meet me in front of the New York Stock Exchange at 6.30 a.m. in the morning, and I want to take you to that breakfast and introduce you to some colleagues that you're never going to meet in your f at least five-year career, in the first five years of your business. And I'm going to feed you like you've never been fed before. Nothing but the very best for you at this restaurant. It's five-star. And um, as you meet some of these colleagues and listen to what they're going to be discussing, and you'll be my guest, and I'll be the guest of a member firm. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Then at 8.30, when they break down that buffet, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Then we're going to go down on the floor and get ready for the Open. Like the Kentucky Derby, the Open is absolutely a frenzy of the first 20 minutes of the most exciting experience of your life. So you can see for live trading when that market opens what you just possibly heard happen at that breakfast. It prom I promise you, you will never forget this day. Never. So here's my question for you. Would you like to go to breakfast with me, yes or no? Yes. yes. How you could not want to is beyond me. Well, there's one little catch. A 90 or better on NASDAQ buys you breakfast. And I don't mean 89.3s. Now you might start to say, hey, look, you know, I'm looking for a goddamn 70 to get out of this with an ugly win. And for some of you, uh, that would be a significant accomplishment because I already know who you are. Are you with me so far? Yes. So that you start to ask yourself, well, how attainable is that goal? Well, why don't you listen to some statistics that I kind of wear like a badge of honor, and then we'll get into the seven. Are you with me so far? Yes. My pass ratio is 94.3% on a candidate's first shot at the seven in less than 55 days flat for 15 years running. I'm not good. I'm lights out! And I have the CRD results to prove it when a candidate went in on the first shot. I am responsible for the highest score that's ever been passed in the industry. Vincent G, 98.3. Nobody's ever beat the score. You can't get 100 on the exam. You Google it. You'll see. Nobody's ever beat that score. 13% of all my students score above a 90 on the exam. And next week, when we get ready to the almighty bonds, you're going to meet a few that scored 92s, 94s, 95s. Because uh, I can't wait to bring them in here so you can see the mastering of this examination from a program that's absolutely up to the challenge of the seven. My average student score is an 82. So if you think this is an ordinary program, and I know you know it's not, I am not teaching you just to pass this exam. I am teaching you to destroy it on the first shot. I mean destroy it. The seven is no match for me. But I know that. But you don't know it yet. But you will. Because I'm going to be with you the week before, the night before, and the day of. And make sure it happens that way. In any case, that's my deal. Take it or leave it. It'll be my pleasure to buy your breakfast. Now let's get into the seven. Listen carefully. There are approximately 10 to 15 questions on the first half only of the Series 7 exam on New York Stock Exchange orders, New York Stock Exchange regulations on this area. And I'm going to start trading with you right now. Are you with me? Yes. I want to talk to you about Client A. Client A is Mr. Johnson. He says, you know, Mr. my broker, out of all those large cap blue chip stocks that we have been building in my large cap blue chip portfolio over the last 18 months, I can't believe that we don't own IBM, Big Blue. But I've come into some excess liquidity, and I'd like to buy the stock right now, and I'm looking to buy 5,000 sh shares of Big Blue in a cash account to add that as part of my large cap blue chip portfolio. Where's the stock trading at right now? About 94 and 7 eighths. How do you feel about that particular price? Is there any news in the marketplace that you think, positive or negative, with respect to where IBM is traded and listed on the New York Stock Exchange as a Dow 30 component, or with respect to the company itself, IBM News, that you believe can significantly in the market affect the performance of that stock price with significant swings, either up or down from where it's trading at right now in the market at 94 and 7 eighths? Broker checks Dow News. He's looking at the marketplace. We're not in earnings quarter. You'll be so far. Yes. He checks IBM news. He doesn't see any significant or external market conditions that could significantly afford and swing that stock's price either up or down one way or the next. He communicates that to the client. Are you with me so far? Yes. He says, Mr. Johnson, I feel pretty confident we can pick up 5,000 shares roughly close to where that stock price is trading at right now, 94 and 7 eighths. Are you listening to me? Yes. Good, because I'm in the middle of a trade. 
He says, do me a favor. Uh, pick me up 5,000 shares. Let's buy the stock. No margin for me. In a cash account. Uh, and uh, get the best possible price of execution that you can to the market. Are you with me so far? Yes. Just make sure that by sometime today at 4 o'clock, I own 5,000 shares of IBM. And call me back with the price of the execution of the order. And call me back with the price of the execution of the order. What kind of an order did he just give you? Cannot hear you. Market order. Seven. That's a market order. Definition of a market order, Series 7. Guarantees execution today. At some point in time today, by the time that market closes, he's going to own, she's going to own 5,000 shares of Big Blue. What is undetermined about the execution of a market order is seven, the price of the execution of the order. It will not be determined until the actual order goes for execution. Are you with me so far? Yes. And that's where you enter. That is what you enter, the type of order that you enter when you feel confident that you can capture close to where that stock price is trading at without uh, external market influences swinging the stock price one way or the other uh, or company uh, influences. Are you with me so far? Yes. That was client A. That's your first type of order. Are you with me so far? It's called the market order. We're banging into the orders now and going after NASDAQ. Are you with me so far? Yes. One order at a time. Now, client B is Mr. Finkelstein. Mr. Finkelstein is a little bit more accredited than Mr. Johnson. You have $1.5 million of his assets under your management. Are you with me so far? Yes. Trading derivatives, trading margin transactions, buying and selling and trading equities. And Mr. Finkelstein asks you about Qualcomm. Are you with me so far? Yes. Where's that stock trading at right now in the marketplace? Let's just make up a price. 65 and 5.8. Are so you with me so far? Yeah. He said, look, I like that stock. I like that company. What do you feel about this company at 65 and 5 eighths? The broker does his due diligence. He looks at the fundamentals. He looks at the technicals of the company. He's looking at the NASDAQ composite where Qualcomm is listed and traded. Are you with me so far? Yes. He likes the stock. He doesn't think it's overbought. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's not at support price, but it's within a consolidated price of resistance and support levels. Thank you, technical research. Are you with me so far? Yes. And he says, Mr. Johnson, I, I feel confident that the stock is going to show some type of movement. I don't expect dramatic movement to the stock price of Qualcomm at 65 and 5 eighths, but I like the stock. And the client said, Listen, 10,000 shares, 65 and 5 eighths. That's where the stock price is trading at. Listen, I hope you get 65 and 5 eighths. Hope you get it to 65. Hope you get it for less than 65, maybe 64 and a quarter. You with me so far? Yes. Don't go out and buy one share more than the price of 65 and 5 eighths. I'm not looking to pay any more than 65 and 5 eighths for the stock. If you can't execute this order at 65 and 5 eighths or better to buy that stock, don't buy the stock. I mean, after all, my broker, I have a certain limit, a price. I'm willing to spend no more than when I accumulate a position in that stock. Ah. What we have now is the first, what is known as order qualifier. It's called a limit order. What is an order qualifier? I know you want to write. I don't want you to write yet. I want you to look up. An order qualifier is qualifying what order? The market order. What do you know about the market order? It's unprotected. You went into the marketplace and bought 5,000 shares of IBM. You felt confident you could roughly capture close to where that stock price was trading at 94 and 7 eighths. Am I right? Yes. But what happens when it comes time for the execution of a market order? Are you with me so far? Yes. At the time to get filled, are you with me so far? Yes. On the floor to go and buy that stock, there is rising momentum and buying coming into the market in IBM at that particular time. You could fill him at a price much higher than 94 and 7 eighths. Are you with me so far? Yes. What happens if you're liquidating a position for your client and you're entering a sell order as a market order to sell stock? You'll be so far yes. to capture short-term trading profits because the client is up a point or a point and a quarter and he wants the point of the point of the quarter. What happens if at the time of liquidation when you sell the position you capture declining momentum uh, because there's selling pressure coming into the stock you can capture a less price, much less than where that stock price was trading at when he was up a point and a quarter. Maybe you can even lose the client a point and a quarter. You're going to be so far. Yes. What is unprotected about a market order is that it doesn't guarantee the price of the execution of the order. At the time that you're accumulating and buying a position in the stock you could be capturing rising momentum or when you're liquidating a position you could be capturing declining momentum in the stock's price. There's no protection. Am I right? Yes. What does a limit order give the broker? to give the client an opportunity of a certain level of protection. On what? On the client's long and or short sale by entering what is known as an order qualifier like a limit order or a stop order or a stop limit order as you're about to see that protect that client. Where's the protection lie? In that here on what is known as a buy limit order built into the order is seven, a limit price. The limit price of a buy limit order is not the price of execution. Look at me. Look at me now. It is the client's limit. A price, buy limit now, he's willing to pay no more than. 
And therefore, if you cannot execute the order at the limit price or better, what's better? Less than when buying. Are you with me so far? Yes. Don't buy the stock! And there's that where the protection lies. Are you with me so far? Yes. If you can't buy 5,000 shares or 10,000 shares of Qualcomm at 65 and 5 eighths by limit, are you with me so far? Yes. 65 and 5 eighths is the limit price. Hope you buy it for 65 and 5 eighths. Hope you buy it for 65. Hope you buy it for 64 and a quarter. Are you with me so far? Yes. Anything more than 65 and 5 eighths, don't buy the stock. That's where the protection lies. He knows that you're not going to execute and buy that stock for any price greater than 65 and 5 eighths. That's where the protection lies. And he's happy not to go along that stock for any price higher than 65 and 5 eighths. Are you with me so far? Yes. GE, 10,000 shares, sell limit, 46 and a quarter, sell the stock. Hope you get 46 and a quarter, hope you get 47, hope you get 48. Don't sell one share of my GE stock for anything less than 46 and a quarter. It's a price I'm not willing to accept any less than, and I'm happy to stay long my portfolio. Are you with me so far? Yes. What is the limit price? It is not the price of execution. It is the client's limit. How many types of orders do we have? Before we go into these orders again, there's only two types of orders. Today has got a lot of purity associated with it. There's no ambiguity today, because the word for today is execution. When I say the word execution, you're thinking buying or selling. Are you so far, there's only two types of orders that we have, buy orders and sell orders. So if I attach a limit order qualifier to the buy or the sell, like a limit order, there's only two types of limit orders, buy limit orders and sell limit orders. What do you know about the limit order? Series 7, it's got a limit price that's built into the order, which is not the price of execution, it is the client's limit. A price, if it's a buy limit order, he's willing to pay no more than when accumulate and go long stock. If you can't fill the order at the limit price or better of a buy limit order, which is less than, are you with me so far? Yeah. Don't buy the stock! And he's happy. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Not to pay any more than that limit price. On a sell limit order, client's looking to sell the position, sell it at the limit price or better, which is greater. If you can't fill the order at the limit price or greater, don't sell the position! Done! Are you with me so far? Yeah. There's your first order qualifier. And that's where the protection lies. It increases the probability. Here's where the protection lies. I'll say it again. Look at me. It increases the probability of missing the market for execution, which is where the client gets that certain comfort zone. It does not guarantee that you'll fill the order. You with me so far? Yes. If you can't fill the order at the limit price, or better. You with me so far? Yes. Don't buy the stock. Don't sell the stock. Done. And there, I promise you, Mr. Johnson, I'll go out in that marketplace and I won't buy that stock for more than one share for more than 65 and 5 eighths. I won't sell your GE position for anything less than 46 and a quarter. Oh, you can do that? Yeah, I can do that. You with me so far? Yes. Do it. Done. And he's got a certain comfort zone. Because the market order is going to get filled. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you with me so yes. far? Yes. I need you to trade with me. Are you with me? Yes. Don't nod to me. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Now, your second type of order qualifier is called a stop order. A little bit different than a limit order. How many types of stop orders do we have? Two. Can you verbalize them to me? Sell stop and buy stop order. Thank you. In a stop order, we have a uh, Series 7 bullet one, a stop price that's built into the order. Again, like the limit price put into the limit order, the stock price is not the price of execution. It is a price, look at me please, that the security, the stock must hit or penetrate through. Not and, penetrate through, hit or penetrate through. Look at me. And once that stock price gets hit or penetrated through, look at me, the order becomes activated. To now become a live order, for you to do what? To either go out and accumulate and buy stock if it's a buy stop order, or sell stock if it's a sell stop order, at what price of execution? Look up, Series 7, at the next tick, which is at the next price. So, know your definition of the stop order, because in a minute, I'm going to trade it with you. Are you with me so far? Yeah. I repeat, in a stop order, we have a stop price. Like in the limit order, we have a limit price. Again, like in the limit order, the stop price is not the price of execution, but it is an activator. Are you with me so far? Yes. In order for the order to go for live execution, the stop price must be seven hit or penetrated through. Now, you're right there, you might have some questions. Question number one. What happens if the stop price gets hit? Are you with me so far on the market? Are you with me so far? The market price hits the stop price. Are you with me so far? And then the market price immediately in seconds comes away from that stop price. It doesn't have to stay there. It just has to hit it once and activates the order. Are you with me so far? Yes. Or penetrate through. Not and penetrate through. You might have another uh, question. That is, what happens if the stock price never gets hit? The order is dead. You do not buy stock. You do not sell stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. The, only order, the, only, the order only goes for live execution when the stock price gets hit. And then at that point, you will execute the order at the next tick. The stop order, like the limit order, is designed to protect profits or limit losses on a client's long position or a short sale cover. And I'm about to show you how, why, and when right now. Are you with me? Yes. The first type of stop order is called a sell stop order. Now, before I go forward, are you with me? Yes. I want you to put your pens down. I want you looking right here, and I want to trade with you. But before I trade, I want to say the following. 
any type of sell order qualifier that you enter, sell limit, sell stop, or sell stop limit, I need you to assume for NASDAQ and in the real world, seven, the client is long a position in the stock. When I say series seven, you need to react. Every day you're supposed to come with a higher level of focus. The fact that you're sitting there and not reacting is making me insane. I said seven, I want you to react. And that means I want you to write it down. You know the way this goes. So let's move. When I say you're entering some type of sell order qualifier, sell stop, sell limit, sell stop limit, I want you to assume for NASDAQ seven, the client is longer positioned in stock. You're going to thank me for this. So let's start reacting when I say seven. I thought you would know that by now. Sell stop order. Look at me. Look at me. Is the client long or short stock? Long. Thank you very much. That's what I need from you. Now, I'm going to show you how the sell stop order is used to protect the profit or limit a loss on the client's long position. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, but before I actually do this trade for a sell stop order, excuse me, I'm going to open up my Stradivarius for you because I'm going to talk to you and trade like a broker. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you ready to trade with me? Yes. Look up. Your clients would long a round lot of GHI at a cost of 25 per share or $2,500. Why'd you buy the stock? Because you believe it is oversold, undervalued at 25 per share. Show me, let me show you what I can do with 100 shares in the position, and then we'll talk about further capital commitments once I show you about my market timing and selection skills and how right it is for your returns on your portfolio. All right, let's buy 100 shares at the stock at 25 a share. You think it's oversold? You think it's undervalued? I'm sure it is. And I believe there's going to be the potential for the rising momentum to capture short-term trading profits. Done. The client executes the order, buys 100 shares of the stock at 25 a share. Are you with me so far? Yes. He says, listen, before the stock actually moves the way we hope, are you with me so far? Yes. Is there some type of order qualifier that we can enter right now? Well, you might want to advise this. Uh, to the client. There is something that we can do right now at the time that you were long the stock, are you with me so far? Yes. That you can enter on your books to lock in and protect those gains on the anticipated rising momentum of the stock's price. And that is, Mr. Johnson, we hope and we believe as a result of buying 100 shares of the stock, the stock price is going to appreciate. Here's what I recommend. Why don't we, you and I together today, on my books, under my management regarding your assets, enter a sell stop round lot 33 stop. Please look up. Please look up. Why don't we enter a sell stop order for a round lot at 33 stop? The order is a sell stop order for 100 shares at 33 stop price. Your clients long the stock at 25. If you believe this will appreciate, are you with me so far? Yes. Above 25, when the 33 stop price gets hit, are you with me so far? Yes. What happens to the order? It becomes live. What do you do? Liquidate the position and sell the 100 shares. Now, you're going to capture the next tick. So if the stock price was bought at 25 and it went up to 33 in the market because the market price hit the stop at 33, that's significant appreciation. There could be immediate short-term trading profits to take that stock price down from 33. You can capture at 28 a share or 31 a share uh, because uh, the price of execution is undetermined because it will be at the next tick. But let me ask you this question. What is the probability of filling the order and selling the position when 33 gets hit above 25 per share? Pretty great, am I right? Yeah. And so when you enter a stop price on a sell stop above the cost basis per share, are you with me so far? Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish for your client? Can you say these two words to me right now? Sip! Right. Protect profits on the client's long position when you enter a stop price above the cost basis, am I right? Yes. On a sell stop! I'll tell you what NASDAQ wants in a minute. Let's just work through these orders and their mechanics. Are you with me? Yes. Look at me. You see the stock that you bought? GHII at 25 a share? What if I told you the stock was Mclone? What if I told you the stock was Omnimedia? What if I told you the stock was Tyco? I mean, who knew? I mean, the unforeseen sell-off in the market as a result of possibly corporate malfeasance only because, accounting for it, only because I'm one for the dramatic. We could just say that this company, at the time that you bought the stock at 25 a share, misses Wall Street's earnings expectations and the stock price is going to get sold off. Are you with me so far? Yes. This stock price is coming down, unforeseen, unexpected, because if it was expected, you would short the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. You bought the stock because you thought it was going to appreciate. Instead, now it's coming down. Now the client needs to hear from you as well. I mean, in our fiduciary role, you've got to call them up and say, Mr. Johnson, I thought the stock price was going to appreciate for all the right reasons. He said the stock price is coming down. We have a company now that shot an earnings warning signal over Wall Street. We're going to miss Wall Street's earnings expectations. Are you with me so far? Yes. This stock price is coming down right now. You're long the stock at 25 a share. The stock is trading at 23 and a quarter, and it's going down even further. I think, Mr. Johnson, what we should do right now, right here, 
while the stock price is coming down, is enter some type of sell order qualifier, like a sell stop, are you with me so far, yes. to get out of this investment. Let's see what portion of your cost basis I can possibly salvage. Are you with me so far? Because yes. we're losing money right now on an idea that's showing declining momentum. Are you with me so far? Yes. And then um, whatever I liquidate, whatever portion of the portfolio I can salvage, convert it into cash, and move you into another recommendation and another idea that I just happen to have that's oversold and undervalued because I am exploding with recommendations and ideas. Isn't that what we do? Are you with me so far? Yes. He agrees. Let's limit the loss. Look up. Sell stop, round lot, 20 stop. Look at that stop price. Where's the client long stock? 25. <laughs> You're entering a stop price below the price of the cost basis on the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. Five points out of the money. When 20 gets hit, are you with me so far? Yes. You believe that's enough. Are you with me so far? Let's yes. limit these losses. Now, uh, the stop price is activated. What do you do? Liquidate the position. Could you capture 18 and 7 eighths, 19 and a quarter? Are you with me so far? Yes. yes. Because it's filled at the next tick after the stop price gets hit. But here, when you enter a stop price on a sell stop below the cost basis per share, what are you trying to accomplish for your client? Please say these two words for me right now. Sip, you're trying to limit a loss on the client's small position of an idea unforeseen that now has declining momentum. Agreed. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. agreed. Okay. I need you to look up. Buy stop orders, the second type of stop order. You know, uh, we buy stock because we may want to accumulate and we're bullish on a particular idea, but I have another idea for you in question. When is the only time in the marketplace, look at me, listen to my question, that you must buy stock? I said must. I don't want it from the crash. To cover a short sale. Are you with me so far? You must buy. Not may want to buy because you're bullish on an idea. Aren't you required to cover the short sale? Yes. And so therefore you must buy stock to cover a short sale. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now let's take a look at what you can retain. Look up. I'm talking buy stop orders. This order has a stop price built into the order that, again, once hit or penetrated through, will activate the order for you to go out there in the marketplace to buy stock to cover a short sale position. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, take a look at the trade. Look up. Client sells short a round lot of ABC stock at 40 a share. Short market value, $4,000. Reg T, $2,000 and TD5. Credit balance, $6,000. And you begin with required equity. Monday night. See, I'm here to haunt you because I know you forgot a little bit of margin. Are you with me so far? Yes. I'm here to make you never forget. Are you with me? Yes. Why did you short the stock at 40 a share? What do you believe? It's going down. <laughs> right. Any price you cover below the price of the stock so short at 40 a share, the bear is in the money. You show gains on depression of stock pricing. Am I right? Yes. Good. So why don't we see if we can try to lock in some of these gains on a strategy that we'll hope will form bearish. Are you with me so far? Yes. Buy stop. Round lot. 38 stop. 38 gets hit. The order's live. What do you do? Protect profits. No. Yeah, but what do you do? How do you protect profits? Liquidate, you're short the stock. You don't liquidate, you're short the stock. What do you do? Buy. You say buy, I say cover. cover. See, why can't we talk this language? You gotta talk that talk if you wanna walk that walk. What movie? You don't know? Full Metal Jacket, Full Metal Jacket, Dirty Dancing. We're sorry, Patrick Swayze, we'll miss you. Are you with me so far? Yeah, my wedding song, Jesus Christ. Oh God, forget you, Donegan. You say buy, I say cover. You say liquidate, I say buy because we're short a position. Therefore, you're not thinking with me. So then when 38 gets hit, the stock price got hit at 38. You're short the stock at 40. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Any price you cover, series 7 below the price of the stock so short, you're in the money. You're looking to protect profits. So are you with me so far? Yeah. Guess what happens at the time you were short the stock at 40 a share? Please listen to me. The company gets acquired. They divest debt and consolidate down, restructure their balance sheet, they're showing a profit, the stock price is rising. Who knew? Mr. Johnson, this stock price is going up, not down. We shorted the stock at 40 a share, she's going up. Stock price right now is trading at 43 and 5 eighths and going higher on this positive news as a result of the merger and acquisition. Mr. Johnson, here's what I recommend. We cover out of the money, try to limit our losses and move into another idea for trading that might have short-term trading profits and momentum. He agrees. <coughs> Buy stop, round lot, 45 stop. Look at that stop price. Look at it carefully. Stay focused. It's five points out of the money. 45 gets hit. Stop price is activated. What do you do? Cover, Cover, Cover. the position. You say it. It is a movie by Stephen King. It was a clown who killed four people, six people. I want you to stay. I want you to say, Cover the position. Are you with me so far? Cover it. You cover it. I'll cover the position. Are you with me so far? And, uh, of course, buy the stock in here. Seven. Any stock price on a buy stock that's entered above the price of the stock so short? What are you doing here? You're trying to sell. Limit losses on the client's short sale cover. Are you with me so far? Yes. I have an exciting question for you. Look at this question. What do market orders, limit orders, and stop orders all have in common? 
They have one thing in common. Don't tell me they're all orders, because then you're going to get me excited, and I know you're going to be great on the phone without any content. Yeah, they're all orders. I want something a little bit more specific to the features of these orders. I'll say the question again. Hang on, Mike. You're a little spontaneous today, like a squirrel. Hang on. Sit down. He's like this, like a squirrel. And they all, calm down. Let me get the question out. Jesus Christ. What do market orders, stop orders, and limit orders all have in common? They're all executed at the market. Really? No, they're not. That's why I told you to not be so spontaneous, because you're not thinking. You're, 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 just, you're just responding out. Excuse me, let me just answer his question. He said, they're all executed to the market. He's going to sound great on the phone. No, they're not. Look at me. Look at me. Here's why. Um, the probability of increasing, missing the market, the execution is, exists here. Uh, and here, if you can't fill the order at the limit price or better, you're not going to get executed. If the stock price never gets hit, it's a dead order. And the only one of the three orders that guarantees to be executed is the market order. So that's not what they all have in common. But thank you very much. Sit back, listen a little bit, maybe give somebody else a chance. What do market orders, limit orders, and stop orders all have in common? Order priority. I'm sorry? Order priority. Order priority. That doesn't really say anything to the specific features of these orders. That is incorrect. But thank you, sir. They protect profits or losses with the protection of the execution of a market order. Order qualifiers increase the probability of missing the market to protect profits or limit losses on a long position or a short sale cover. But the market order has no protection. It is a volatile order that could capture volatility in the marketplace when you're accumulating and buying on rising momentum or liquidating on declining momentum. So that can't be what they all have in common. But thank you very much as well. Something specific to the features of these orders. They all have something specific in common to the features of these orders. Market orders, limit orders, and stop orders. Spinelli. Hi. How are you doing today, Kennedy? No idea, Crash. Hey, Crash? Crash? You don't have to raise your hands, Tegan. You can just give me the answer. They're all long positions. They're all long positions? Tegan, you've lost your mind. You've lost your... No, Tegan. What's long about these orders? They're not all long positions. They're order qualifiers or a market order. They have something in common. It's got nothing to do with whether you're short or long stock. Something specific in common uh, to the features of these orders. Alan? We're not sure. Andre? We're not sure. Donegan? Wow, crash. Neither all of the three have a specific price of execution, right? Market order, that's by the definition of the market order. We don't know the specific price. Look at this. When the stop price gets in and, 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 and a stop order goes for live execution, we feel that, though, look at me, next tick. We don't know what the next tick specifically is, but it's the next price. Uh, to execute the limit price or better, which is less than, non-specific, or greater than on the sell limit, non-specific. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, do any of those orders have a specific price of execution? And so now we come down to the final order qualifier, and that, of course, is the stop limit order. What is the stop limit order? Well, before we answer that, how many types of stop limit orders do we have? Two. Can you verbalize them to me? Buy stop limit, sell stop limit. Right. The stop limit order, listen carefully before I trade it with you uh, in Chapter 11 in the body of your work. You know where we're at. Is the combination of the stop order and the limit order, look at me, all rolled into one type of order. Well, that means what? That means that the stop limit order has the combination of the features of the stop order and the limit order all rolled into one type of order to the following expression. In a stop limit order, listen carefully, it has a stop price built into the order, just like it did in a stop order. That stop price in a stop limit order, just like in a stop order, must be hit or penetrated through, which will activate the order in a stop limit order, just like in a stop order. Once the stop price is hit, which activates the order in a stop limit order, listen now. The stop price then becomes transferred into the limit price to be executed to the market at the limit price or better, which is part of the definition of a limit order now, which is less than when accumulating or greater than when distributing and selling stock uh, to protect profits or limit losses on the client's long sale, long position or short sale cover. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let's take a look now. That's the definition of it. Let's see how it works. Are you with me so far? Yes. I want to read that trade right in the body of your work. You know where we're at. <laughs> sell stop limit order. There's your first type of stop limit order. Is the client long or short stock? Long. long, because you're entering some type of sell order qualifier, and here he's long, and here's a client who accumulates a position of 1,000 shares of DEF at $15 per share, $15,000 transaction, are you with me so far? Yes. And the broker calls up and says, let's enter a sell stop limit order at 10. 10 gets hit, stop price. The order becomes live for execution. Execute this order to sell 1,000 shares of the position at 10 or better. You're looking to liquidate above 15 to capture short-term trading profits. Are you with me so far? Yes. See how the order works? Yes or no? Yes. Yes or no? Look at me. Yes or no? Yes. Wow. I believe you. 
You're going to be good. Buy stop limit order, short, long or short. Buy stop limit order, short. You're buying stock to cover a short sale. Are you with me so far? Buy stop limit order. Are you with me so far? Yes. Calm down, Mike. Are you with me? Yes. Take a look at the position. Your client short 1,000 shares of GHII at a short market value of $10,000. Are you with me so far? Yes. Why'd you short the stock? You're looking to cover below 10. Am I right? Yes. Because if you cover below 10, which is the price that the stock was sold short at, you're locking in gains. Are you with me so far? Yes. So how can we see if we can give ourselves a certain level of protection and try to lock in on those gains? Why don't we enter a buy stop limit at 14? 14 stock price gets hit. The order's live, and you look to cover below 10 a share to lock in on the bearish strategy of stock price depression. Are you with me so far? Yes. So the 7 is going to give you trades just like this. Series 7, Series 7. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to NASDAQ now. Watch what they're going to do. They're going to give you a transaction, just like the transactions we've just read. They're going to tell you the client is long stock or is short stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. And the respective number of shares in the short position or the long position. They're going to give you prices. Are you with me so far? Yes. Like here is long 1,000 shares of stock at 15 a share, or he's shorted 1,000 shares of stock at 10 a share. They're going to give you the position. Are you with me so far? Yes. They're going to tell you that the client contacted the account executive, which will be you on NASDAQ. In the question. Concerned about limiting losses. Or maybe the client is looking to lock in gains. Are you with me so far? Yes. Regarding his long or short position. It's a transaction. Are you with me? Yes. Then they're going to give you four choices. In the four choices, there'll be two buy order qualifiers and two sell order qualifiers relative to the positions at their respective prices. Are you with me so far? Yes. To fulfill the client's investment objectives, to either lock in those gains on a long position or limit losses on a short sale cover. Are you with me so far? Yes. There are two steps to break down the correct answer here. You with me so far? Yes. I'm going to tell you exactly how to break down the question. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yield the proper response. Step one, seven, in the question. First, identify if the client is long or short stock. And here's why that's important. Because look up. If he's along a position, are you with me so far? Yes. You eliminate the two buy order qualifiers. There's going to be two buy order and two sell order qualifiers out of the four choices. You don't have to buy a stock that he's already long. Are you with me so far? Yes. Right. And then you will select out of the two uh, sell order qualifiers of clients who have long stock. Are you with me so far? The sell order qualifier at the price above his cost basis if he's looking to lock in gains or below the cost basis of his long position if he's looking to limit losses. Are you with me so far? Yes. If he's short a position. Eliminate the two sell order qualifiers because you have to buy the cover. You'll be so far. Yes. If he's looking to lock in gains, you enter the order qualifier relative to the short sale position and the short sale cover below the price of the stock sold short. If he's looking to limit loss on an idea that has rising momentum for stock that he's short, you enter the uh, buy order qualifier by limit, by stop, by stop limit above the price of the stock sold short to limit the losses on a short sale cover. That's how you break the questions down. It's two parts. You'll be so far. Identify the position. Identify the client's investment objectives, and you'd be right down to entering one of the two sell order qualifiers of stock that he's long to limit losses or protect profits. If he's short a position, are you with me so far? Yes. Eliminate the two uh, sell order qualifiers because you have to buy the cover uh, and enter the buy order qualifier above the price of the stock sold short to limit losses or below the price of the stock sold short to lock in those gains. Are you with me so far? Yes. Don't worry. About a, I have about 55 of those transactions for you to take a look at tonight with the answers and explanations as we step up this week. Are you with me so far? Yes. What? But you know, I got to talk to you about other New York Stock Exchange language and other New York Stock Exchange regulations. So here we go. Sit back and take the ride. You have an order to execute at the open. Look at me. Client says buy the stock at the open. You enter on the buy ticket or the sell ticket. If it's sell, the sell at the open. At 931, that order is sitting with your trader. As soon as that market opens up, you're looking to buy or sell stock. That's an at the open. And at the close, order is not actually filled at 4 because the market is closed at 4, but as close to the close as humanely possible. So when you see 356, 357, 358 p.m., are you with me so far? Yes. You're running that order into trading. Are you with me so far? Yes. At the close. A not held order, Series 7, Bullet 1. Stay with me, I got a lot of regulation for you today. This is an order, not held, that is held by the floor broker and executed by the floor broker. Now let's take a look at the not held order. You have a floor broker who has an order to buy 500 shares of GE, not held, at 57 and a quarter. This means that the floor broker will not be held liable, Series 7, he will not be held liable as to price and time of execution. As to price and time of execution. Let me tell you what that means. If when this floor broker goes to buy 500 shares of GE at 46 and a quarter, are you with me so far? Yes. 
If he could have purchased this stock, GE, at a better price than the price he actually did fill the order at, and furthermore, if he could have executed and bought that stock at a better time in the market than when he actually did buy the stock at, he will not be held liable. So therefore, what does a non-held order give the floor broker? Built-in immunity as to price and time of execution. Sit! Are you with me so far? Yes. A good till cancel order, series seven, is only held on the books of the specialist. This order is good until it is canceled by the specialist. It must be periodically refreshed and renewed by the specialist until the order is canceled by the specialist. Are you with me so far? Yes. You got an order that you write up to buy 5,000 shares of IBM. Are you with me so far? Yes. At 94 and 7 eighths, executed as a market order, and it says on the order, all or none. You trade the sees this and he says all or none. You look at him and you say all or none. You have to buy all 5,000 shares of the stock at 94 and 7 eighths or buy none of the stock at all. Okay, buy 5,000 shares of IBM, 94 and 7 eighths. Watch this, immediate or cancel, it says on the order. Buy the stock immediately or cancel the order. That means right now. It says on the order ticket to buy 5,000 shares of IBM at 94 and 7 eighths, executed as a market order, fill or kill. Trader says to you, fill or kill? It's a fill or kill order. Buy all 5,000 shares at 94 and 7 eighths. Buy it immediately or buy none of it at all and kill the order. What is the fill or kill order? This is New York Stock Exchange language. It is the combination of the all and none, the immediate cancel, all roll into one. Buy it all, buy it immediately, or kill it and cancel the order. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you with me so far? Yes. Thank you. I needed your response. How about this? How about if you had the opportunity, and you have it all the time, to be able to speak to some of your seasoned and accredited clients and say, Mr. Johnson, if you give me an opportunity to continue to manage your portfolio, I promise you, the only execution will come from the specialist in the stock. Mr. Johnson, you cannot get any better execution than a market maker in the stock. Are you so far? We set the prices. We maintain stock price equilibrium. I promise you, when most normal orders will get filled by the floor broker, are you with me so far? Yes. Because every member firm or affiliated member firm has to have a relationship with a floor broker on the floor and a floor representation and a presence. Are you with me so far to execute the order? No floor broker execution for you. I will bypass that floor broker and have your orders be directly executed by the specialist in the stock. You can do that and I can do that. When you, at the branch level, Enter the order seven through super dot. Super dot is designated order turnaround. Super designated order turnaround. Look at me. Look at me. Order turnaround. What does that mean? This system is not a system of execution. I repeat, it is not an electronic system of execution. Look at me. It is an order routing system. You see, when orders go to the floor, are you with me so, so far through automation? They go first where? Automatically to the floor broker. Are you with me so far? Yes. He may give it over to a floor clerk or a $2 broker for execution, or he may execute it himself, but he's going to be executing it uh, as the floor broker for execution. Are you with me so far? Yes. You want to bypass him and go directly to the specialist through the market maker in the stock. Floor brokers don't see orders that come through super dot. You want to know why? They go directly to the specialist in the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. And the specialist will execute orders through super dot, which is an order routing system that is um, being filled by the specialist regarding odd lot and round lot position series 7 covering market and limit orders. And it was created to uh, increase the efficiency in the marketplace with respect to more timely execution. Are you with me so far? So this system called super designated order turnaround is not on the floor. It is only held where most of you work at the branch level. Are you with me so far? Yes. Go into your trading department and ask your trader, you have a super dot? Uh, location over here is going to show you super dot. Super dot can bypass, will bypass the floor broker for direct execution by the specialist in the stock covering odd lot and round lot positions for market and limit orders. Set order routing system, right? Right? Look at me. I feel very lonely here today. I got three little Sicilian kids and a Sicilian wife. They don't answer me at home. And the fact that you're not answering me today is making me very nervous. Are you with me? Yes. Are you here to trade with me? Yes. Then fucking trade with me. I got a little excited there. And I said I wouldn't curse today. But you know it was going to happen, didn't you? You knew it was going to happen. You've been waiting for it since I saw you on Monday. Well, now you got it. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Well, so let's talk about that order. I want to talk about the flow of the order. This is all NASDAQ now. This is big time seven now. Where did the order go first when you want to buy or sell the stock? What department? It goes to the wire room, which is the old name for the trading department, which will execute the order. Are you with me so far? Yes. Then where does the order go? It goes into what is called, you have to know the flow of the order now. Are you with me so far? This is the flow of the listed execution. It then goes to the purchase and sales department. And what does that department do? 
uh, whether somebody is buying a thousand shares of Qualcomm, somebody's got to be selling a thousand shares of Qualcomm to the market. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So what does this department do? It matches the orders between a buyer of Qualcomm and a seller of Qualcomm. And we have a name for that. It's called trade reconciliation. To reconcile the trade is to match the order between a buyer and a seller regarding a position in the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. And we have a department that does that. Are you with me so far? Yes. Isn't this wonderful? And then where does the department, um, what, what, where does the order go? What department? It goes to the margin department. Now, limited knowledge is very dangerous, which is what you have. Are you with me? Yes. So what would we normally think? We would think normally that the margin department is a department that handles margin transactions. I mean, wouldn't you think that? Yeah. I mean, that's why it's called the margin department. Am I right? Uh, did I say anything about this transaction purchased or shorted on margin? I didn't say that. But it is a department that does not just handle margin transactions, as you would normally think, but rather a, trans a department that handles the settlement of the trade so that the client is insured to pay, by, pay the security by settlement, whether it was purchased in a cash account or in a margin account. Are you with me so far? Yes. So it handles the settlement of the transaction. Are you with me so far? Yes. So I'm going to give you substitutional language that will interpret the purposes of these departments, and so get with this right now. First, department is the wire room which facilitates Series 7 Bullet 1 trade execution. Then the order flows to the purchase and sales department, which is matching the orders between buyer and seller, which means what? Trade reconciliation. And then the order goes into the margin department to ensure that the client has paid for the transaction by settlement date. So what does this department do? Trade settlement. Look up. Trade execution, trade reconciliation, and trade settlement. Seven, seven, seven. You got to say yes. yes. You need to be with me on the beat. You want to be licensed really quick? Try to stay with me on the beat, and it'll be over that quick. Right? Right. But we do have a couple of other New York Stock Exchange regulations that are on the 7, and they're not going away. So if I were you, I would listen to me very carefully. Do not accept a gift from a client in any form that exceeds seven one hundred dollars It's called the New York Stock Exchange Compensation Rule. It is now the same for FINRA as we saw in the over-the-counter market. It will be in week three for MSRB when we get into the bond side. Are you with me? Yes. In any form. And now I want to talk to you about the New York Stock Exchange erroneous reporting rule. Erroneous report means what? False report. That was unintentionally communicated to the client. The client said, listen, I have three girls. And I've been after my wife for the fourth child because I want that son. I want my namesake coming into the world. I love my three girls. They feed me grapes every night. I cut my heart out for them. I want my son. And so since we started having children, I said, listen, we're going to go. And she agreed with me all the way until we have that son. So it's... Four children later, but guess what? Last night at um, 6, 6 15 p.m., uh, John Jr. was born, my son, seven pounds, three ounces, and I caught that umbilical cord. He came right down that vaginal canal, right in my arms. Heard that baby cry, and I can't tell you how exciting it was. I got my son. Listen, oh, uh, when the child is born, you're a young financial advisor. You're making a lot of money. You're doing well by me. I'm really excited about it. But I got to tell you that when you have children, it's, that's something you choose. You may choose not to have children, and that's okay, too. The very first thing that they do is, after they wipe the blood off the baby and spank it and wrap it around um, in towels, is they put that child right on mommy's nipple to start that maternal bonding right away. And this kid was sucking away. And they were having a great time together. And that's just when my wife was the weakest. And she looked at me and she said, oh, honey, isn't he beautiful? I said, he's beautiful, honey. He looks like us, doesn't he, honey? Yes, just like me and you, honey. And I, I, I looked into my wife's eyes and I whispered into her here. I said, honey, got to call my financial advisor today. You see, we got to get that college fund starting right away. So if it's okay with you, we're going to bake the treasury bill portfolio and send the client on a wire fed funds today, $200,000. And that's when she said, okay, but isn't he beautiful? So I got her approval. I'm wiring into the account $200,000 today by Fed Funds. Fed Funds hits by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Take those assets. Let's start the college fund right away, and let's buy Disney common stock under UGMA. Uniform Gifts to Minors Act. Of course, I'll be custodial uh, to the account, custodian to the account. Send me out the suitability papers. I know regular way settlement is TD3. It's not going to matter because the assets will establish a credit balance into the account. Buy the stock. Call me back with the price of execution. I'll be painting the nursery. They'll be home in a week. I can't wait to start this fund. Not only... Well, I buy that stock for you. Congratulations on your John Jr. fourth child and your namesake coming into the world. But you tell your wife when you go to the hospital tonight that I'm going to contact the issuer, Disney, for the certs, which are the certificates, because they're quite unique. 
in that they have the full Disney animated characters and all of Disney's colors around the border <laughs> with your son's name, John Jr., and the purchase of a position of 10,000 shares of a block of stock. And I'm sure she's going to want to frame that in the nursery. I'm going to get that sent right to your home, and I'm going to frame it too. And you tell your wife, I'll be at the hospital tomorrow night to kiss you, your wife, and the child um, as your financial advisor. <laughs> I got my heartbeat on the street of dreams. I'll take care of this trade. You just continue to take care of that nursery and take care of your family. Don't you worry about a thing down here. Listen, I told you, I'll be here painting the nursery. Call me back with the price of execution. I'm anxious to know. Get this fund opened up. It's college fund opened up and started. So the broker executes the order. Tells the trader to buy 10,000 shares of the stock in the position. Are you with me so far? Yes. Uh, in lieu of Fed funds coming into the account. And uh, communicates to the broker that he'll be able to buy 10,000 shares of the stock at 27 and 3 quarters. Client uh, gets a phone call from the broker that he's going to be buying 10,000 shares of the stock at 27 and 3 quarters. Uh, broker goes to a meeting that day after the trade, uh, or at least thought the trade was executed. And then the client the next day in TD1 got a confirmation that he bought 10,000 shares of the stock at 31 and 5 eighths. Client calls up in an uproar. I thought you told me you bought 10,000 shares of the stock at 26 and a quarter. I got a confirmation I just bought 10,000 shares of the stock at 31 and 5 eighths. What's going on here? Well, at the time that the stock was executed as a market order, there was some rising momentum in the execution of the order that the broker wasn't aware of. Are you with me so far? Yes. At the last minute when the order to get filled, uh, when the order went to go get filled, so you captured some rising momentum. Or the next day, I'll give you an alternative scenario. The client doesn't get a confirmation. And he calls up and he says, listen, you did buy the stock. I absolutely <laughs> did buy the stock. Let me check because I didn't get my confirmation. Don't worry about it. I'll check for you. And compliance held up the trade because they wanted to wait because of the size of the order for the Fed fund wire to come into the account, uh, which didn't hit until the next day. So because the credit balance was in the account, uh, they wanted to make sure the assets would be in account to cover. The broker wasn't aware of this. It would be so far because yeah. he went to a meeting. Listen, unintentional reports, erroneous reports, are not intentional that are communicated to the client, but they could be communicated to the client unintentionally. If that is the case associated with the execution or the lack of execution wearing a listed stock, automatically this problem, this uh, erroneous report, is regulated by the New York Stock Exchange erroneous reporting rule, which comes in and says the following. Mr. Johnson, the only criteria that is binding on you concerning an unintentional and erroneous report regarding the execution or the lack of execution of a listed stock is Series 7, the price of the execution of the order. So let's take a look at both scenarios a little bit more acutely now. In Scenario 1, on TD1, when the client got a confirmation that he bought 10,000 shares at 31 and 7 eighths regarding an unintentional and erroneous report that was communicated to the client by the broker that he bought the stock at 27 and a quarter. You with me so far? Yes. This rule says that your client is binding it to pay 31 and, a, and 7 eighths. So you with me so far? Yes. Now, is the client like it to pay 31 and 7 eighths? Probably not. Will he force a customer complaint and will the compliance department try to avoid arbitration and settle the client? Sure. Uh, but the rule says he is binded into uh, the higher price of execution. Are you with me so far? Because yeah. that's the price the order was filled. Look at scenario two. Client got no confirmation. Are you with so received no confirmation? And compliance held up the trade because the Fed fund wire didn't hit and they wanted to wait for money in the account along with suitability documents to be signed by the client before they would facilitate the execution of an order regarding a custodial account. You know, so far. Yes. Well, then there's nothing binding on the client uh, because the only criteria that's binding on the client is the price of the execution of the order. And therefore, the only really damaging uh, scenario that happened there was the loss of credibility that the broker now has. Uh, by the client in the broker and that probably will be the end of the relationship because the relationship is based first on trust and then on returns. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, we talk about the New York Stock Exchange erroneous reporting rule, a rule that requires that concerning an erroneous report that was unintentionally given to the client regarding the execution of an order, uh, that uh, the only criteria that's binding on the client is the price of the execution of the order. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, now we deal with a little bit more of an ambiguous rule. And this is called the New York Stock Exchange Nine Bond Rule. Now I need you to listen to me because I'm going to play semantics with you because uh, the rule has ambiguity associated with its language. Are you with me? Yes. New York Stock Exchange Nine Bond Rule is a rule that relates to the execution. It is a rule that relates to the execution concerning, listen carefully, the purchase of nine bonds or less listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Now right there you've got to listen to what I mean. You don't have to worry about where it is. You need to listen to me. Look at me. This rule has nothing to do with the purchase of nine bonds or more, uh, and it has nothing to do with the purchase of bonds in the OTC on the NASDAQ, but rather bonds that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Bonds are listed on the New York Stock Exchange as well as they're listed in the over-the-counter market. Am I right? Yes. This rule has nothing to do with nine bonds or 
uh, more, 10 bonds or less, or 10 bonds or more. Watch what I'm saying to you. This is a rule regarding the execution concerning the purchase of nine bonds or less listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Are you with me so far? Yeah. And before we get into the rule, how will you know they're talking about the nine bond rule on NASDAQ? I mean, what do you think they're going to do? You think question number 58 is going to come up out of 250 over a six hour relentless period of time and say, the following is the nine bond rule? They're not doing it that way. Are you with me so far? Yeah. How you will know is when you see the following wording seven. Mr. Johnson contacts his account executive for the purchase of six bonds listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the nine bond rule. Are you with me so far? Yes. That's how you will know. Now, let's take a look at the rule, and then we'll show you what's waiting for you on NASDAQ, which is a little bit different than the rule. Are you with me so far? Yes. Which is one of the biggest problems that we have here, which is what I'm battling through. Now, the rule has two components, two parts to the rule. Part one, of the nine bond rule says this, please look at me. When an account executive has an order for the purchase of nine bonds or less that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the nine bond rule says, bullet one, that the broker is required to first go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and check for a price for the order. So what am I telling you to do now? I'm telling you first where to go and what to do there. I said, go to the floor and check for a price for the order. That's simple enough, am I right? Yes. It's the second part of the rule that's a little bit amb ambiguous. And then series seven, bullet two, under the nine bond rule, watch me now. Buy those bonds on the floor at a price equal to or better than any other price you could have received to buy these bonds away from the floor on the NASDAQ and execute the order on the floor. <coughs> Don't worry, I'll repeat it. Part one of the rule, check for a price for the order on the floor. Pretty simple, right? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Buy the bonds on the floor at a price that is equal to or better than any of the price you could have received to buy these bonds away from the floor on the NASDAQ and execute the order on the floor. Buy the bonds on the floor at a price of execution that is equal to or better than any of the price you could have received to purchase these bonds away in the OTC and execute the order on the floor. Go to the floor. Check for a price for the order and then buy the bonds on the floor at a price equal to or better than any other price you could have received to execute these bonds away from the floor and execute this order on the floor under the nine bond rule. Are you with me so far? Yes. Do you know the rule? Yes. You gotta answer me guys and gals. Yes. Do you know the rule? Yes. Yes. NASDAQ series seven is a little bit different, isn't it? Here it comes. Are you ready? Yes. This is your license. An account executive receives instructions for the execution of the purchase of six bonds listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The nine bond rule is in effect. Listen to me carefully. The client gives further instructions to his financial advisor to bypass floor execution and execute this order for the purchase of six bonds away from the floor and the OTC on the NASDAQ. A, under the nine bond rule, the broker may not comply. Execution is required to be filled on the floor. B, Execution may only be filled in the over-the-counter, away from the floor, under the nine bond rule. Bypassing nine bond rule execution uh, for location, if the broker can execute a price for the purchase of these bonds in the over-the-counter that is equal to or better than a price you could have received to buy them on the floor. C, broker must comply. D, none, go. The seven just ripped you and you didn't even see it. I'm going to say this again. Under the nine bond rule, the broker is required to execute the order on the floor. Are you with me so far? Yes. B, the broker may only execute these bonds away in the OTC and bypass floor execution if he can capture a price that's equal to or better than the price you could have received to buy the bonds on the floor. C, the broker must comply, D, none. Go! <coughs> A. A is incorrect. The answer is C. It's not what we think. And that is, the broker simply must comply. <coughs> If the client gives you instructions to bypass New York Stock Exchange nine bond floor execution and buy these bonds away in the over-the-counter market, regardless of the price of the, of the execution of the OTC, the broker must comply. Seven. So you see what NASDAQ did? They took the rule and they took it out of complete context. Are you with me? Yeah. That's the problem we have here. There's nothing straight up here. Nothing. That is straight up here. Are you with me so far? Yes was straight up, you wouldn't need me. Believe me, you need me big. But you know what? I need you too. So why don't we just continue to need one another? Feel all warm all over. Now look, I'm going to give you an impression of an ex-president. He's dead now. Are you with me so far? Yes. You tell me if you think you know who this president was. Well, right, Ronald Reagan. The only one close to my age around here. Or was everybody else? 
in grammar school having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when he was the goddamn president? How old are you? Are you with me so far? That's okay. Well, remember Ron? Ron, Republican Ron, Reaganomics Ron, trickle-down theory of economics Ron, of big government, big Republican hat. Are you with me so far? Ron Reagan, former governor of California. These governors of California have almost a fast track to the White House. Are you with me so far? A lot of them. Certainly to run, at least. Why? Because the California economy is, I don't know if you know the statistic, and you should Google this. I know Crash would love to test me to see if I'm wrong on something. I wish you would try to. But you know it was ranked as the sixth largest economy in the world. I don't know if you understand the impact of what I'm saying. That's just California! The economy of the state of California is the sixth largest economy in the world. And so that's why um, usually governors have a fast track to high exposure to the White House in some form, whether they actually win or they run. Are you with me so far? They're up there. It's like tailbacks at USC that have a high probability of winning a Heisman. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Certain natural progression in life, you know what I'm talking about. Can you imagine this particular California governor that becomes the future president of the United States? I'll be back. We don't want this guy to become president, do we? No, not this guy. Schwarzenegger, are you with me so far? Oh, my God. Well, let's talk about the um, market crash of 87. Stock market crash of October 19th of 1987, are you with me so far? Yes. We're getting ready next month to approach its anniversary, uh, was one of the significant and historical days in the market's collapse of a massive sell-off, where well, the market went down 508 points. The 508 decline represented a 22.3 decline for the index. So what we care about more than anything else is percentage increases or decreases for an index, not necessarily point declines. Now, you know that the market has gone down 777 in greater point declines than that 508. Then there was the 554-point market decline as a result of the recent real estate collapse that sent massive spiraling sell-offs to the marketplace that suspended naked short selling by the SEC, which we'll get into down the road. Are you with me so far? Yes. That would have eliminated, that would have contributed to a further collapse. But, um... That 508, if that occurred today, a 508-point market decline, are you with me so far? Yes. Would only represent, look at me, a 4% decline for the index. Still considerable, but not quite a 22% decline for the index. Why? Because the market is much broader today than it was in 87. Are you with me so far? Yes. Smaller market, the point decline representing a greater percentage decline. Are you with me so far? Yes. That 22.3% uh, market decline on October 19th of 1987 defined and established the definition of a crash in the market. Are you with me so yes. far? Uh, that also established a severe decline or a correction. And documentation that I gave you at the end of taxation in week one known as understanding market risks that you should be a little bit aware of right now because it was required reading. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, then what happened was we had the big bear years of 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, and 92. And then Microsoft came along and led a bull run for 10 years to 2002. And then again, another collapse. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, there was a bear, there was a bull, right? Right. Well... You're coming out of a bear and hopefully out of a recession to ride the next appreciation of the next bull run. You'll be licensed by then, and I can't wait for you to join that market where your market timing is perfect regarding your entrance into this industry, and we continue to talk why. Well, I have a coffee cup. Crash knows about this, and I want you to know that I drink out of every Sunday morning after I go to a Japanese men's club and I give Miss Kim $150 for shiatsu, and I lie on needles, and she kicks the living shit out of me, and I say thank you, and then I go pick up the Dunkin' Donuts, and then I go home with the insane family uh, because of my days from Japan. I still belong. I'm the only white Caucasian that belongs to this Japanese men's club, and I go to this woman every Sunday morning. You can't find me at 7 o'clock in the morning, and she beats the hell out of me, and I walk out going, thank you, Miss Kim. I give her $150 for to beat the shit out of me and lie on needles. I feel great, and then I can take on the kids and anything that they want to throw at me, and they throw everything at me. But on Sunday morning, with the coffee and the Dunkin' Donuts and the whole nonsense, they're sucking chocolate creams out of, uh, out of donuts, bouncing off the walls with the sugar attack. I drink my coffee out of this coffee cup that I got from 87. And that's Dad's coffee cup. You can't drink out of this coffee cup. And on the coffee cup, I'm not a good drawer, you know, I'm really not. But, you know, the coffee cup has the technical graph on it. Uh, that represents the staggering mass of bloodbath and sell-off from 29, are you, uh, from uh, 87. Are you with me so far? Yes. My coffee cup, Sunday morning. I always look at it. 
You know, I lost more money on that day than I hope you make in two lifetimes. I lost a firm that I built. It took me uh, seven years to build. I lost it in less than 24 hours. Uh, I had more than 2,000 stockbrokers working for me in 27 offices. I lived in the plane for two and a half years, and I hired every single one of them. Uh, from city to city to city, and I micromanaged and trained every one of them. Yeah, it took me years to build a firm. I lost it in one day. Well, forget about the staggering losses that I incurred. You know, forget me. But I do want you to know that when Reagan came on television on the evening of Black Monday, are you with me so far? Yes. He had an emergency State of the Union address to the nation to try to calm the fears of the American people because we hadn't seen a crash like that since 29. Are you with me so far? Yes. And he came on television that night, and he said, well, we don't want the American people to worry about a thing. Because, uh, you know, Congress, I'm getting ready with Congress right now to pass some bills uh, to implement certain systems and circuit breakers in the market to ensure that this crash that happened today never happens again. And what did we say? Do you remember what he looked like, Ron Reagan? He looked like everybody's eye doctor. Uh, he's like, everybody's like, everybody's like gentle dad. He had nice, nice complexion. And, and we would, he had this fatherly figure about him. We would say, oh, Ron's talking. You know, Ron's going to make it all okay. Ron said it's never going to happen again. And don't worry about it. Ron said it's all right. Thanks, Ron. He was always like this, this, this warm, you know, fatherly figure. And we always felt pretty safe when he spoke. Are you with me so far? Yes. Of course, he did implement... Uh, the circuit breakers that you're studying right now. ADA and ADB are the byproduct of the Reagan administration as a result of the market crash of 87 that is still in effect today that has uh, been moving in the market many times and uh, facilitated in the market to shut down certain aspects of the market when there's a lot of volatility. ADA and ADB are circuit breakers that limit market volatility when we already have a volatile market ongoing. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let's take a look at ADA. ADA says this. Look at me for a minute. I'll show you ADA. When the value of the DJIA either increases or decreases by more than 2% from its current level, you've got to know the percentage. ADA is triggered. And what does ADA do? ADA do? ADA shuts down program trading. Bless you, it means it's true. Program trading and index arbitrage transactions. These aspects of the market are usually of significant size that if ADA was not in place and program trading and indexed arbitrage transactions were allowed to continue, are you with me so far, would only further swing and inflate the market even higher than its increased inflated 2% from the Dow's current level or take it down even further if the decline was 2% uh, below the current value of the Dow. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so that's why those areas are shut down in the market. Are you with me so far? because they would only contribute to further market volatility uh, because of program trading's size and, uh, of course, index arbitrage transactions size with respect to those positions. And so, therefore, ADA says, shut down program trading and index arbitrage transactions when the value of the DJIA increases or decreases by more than 7, 2% from its current level. We don't want the market to go any more, high, any, any more inflated than 2% up from where it was or down. Uh, below 2% from where it was. Are you with me so far? It would shut down program trading and index arbitrage transactions when the value of the DJIA increases or decreases by more than 2% from its current level. Are you with me so far? What's index arbitrage? Well, let's talk about arbitrage transactions. I'm glad you asked. I was going to volunteer it, but I'm glad you asked. Arbitrage. Arbitrage. Sounds English to you. Talk to me for a minute. You're like a step behind today. Are you with me here today? Yes. Good, because I'm double your age, and there's something going on here where you can't. You're looking at me like I'm on an MTV commercial. <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. Okay, arbitrage. Uh, sounds French? Yes. yes sure. Uh, this transaction that I'm about to do with you is called an arbitrage transaction. I'm going to explain index arbitrage trading in a moment. First, I want to talk about arbitrage transactions. Are you with me so far? Yes. One step at a time. And if I did this transaction uh, and transactions like this uh, every single day, are you with me so far? Yes. I would be known as an arbitrageur from the French exchange. Uh, a trader goes out and accumulates a position in IBM. Where is IBM listed? New York Stock Exchange. Thank you very much for being there. And uh, when he then goes and liquidates the position, and when he sells the IBM stock, are you with me so far? Yes. He sells it to another exchange or another marketplace. The purchase of a security from one exchange and or market, <coughs> and the liquidation of that same security to another market or another exchange only is known as an arbitrage transaction. Are you with me so far? 
Yes. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, look up. The difference between the amount of money I received when I liquidated IBM to the Amex, the NASDAQ, or the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, if you will, versus the amount of money I paid when I went long IBM from the New York, are you with me so far? Yes. It's known as my arbitrage spread profit that I work for every day in the transaction. Are you with me so far? Yes. If I did that every day, I would be known as an arbitrageur. Arbitrageur. Are you with me? Yes. I think you got to do that with your lips if you want to speak French. Arbitrageur. Is that arbitrageur? <laughs> Hang on. Index arbitrage transactions is the buying and selling of uh, index options uh, on an index, uh, option contracts on an index. Because of the significant size of those derivative index arbitrage transactions with respect to positions and program trading, which is institutional transactions, so, so far, they could further contribute towards a greater inflated Dow that's already up by more than 2% or a depressed Dow that's already down by more than 2% from its current levels uh, because of the size of those particular uh, aspects of the market. And so when the DJIA has increased and decreased by more than 2% from its current level, shut down those components of the market so that we uh, limit further volatility. That's why it's a circuit breaker. Uh, breakers that we didn't have in 87 that Ronald put in, thank you, Big Ron, through the Reagan administration. Look at me. ADB is different. Let's assume that the value of the Dow is at $10,000. Are you with me so far? Yes. Just using some round numbers. Now, if the uh, sell-off is occurring in the marketplace, and the Dow goes down 1,000 points. At an index that was at $10,000, that means the Dow is down 10%. Are you with me so far? Yes. ADE would, ADB would be triggered, which would shut down and suspend the market for one hour. No trading, no buying, no selling. She's shut down. After she opens up from that one hour, the idea being that the sell-off, which uh, occurred, that declined 1,000 points, might induce people to come in and accumulate positions and buy at low tremendously oversold prices. Are you with me so far? Yes. What if the Dow went down 2,000 points of an index that was at $10,000, which is a 20% Dow decline? Seven, ADB says shut down that market for two hours. And 3,000 points is 30% of an index that was at 10, to use an example, 30% shut the market down for the remainder of the day. Circuit breakers that we didn't have in 87 that just led to a massive bloodbath and a sell-off all the way to four. That would have saved the market's massive sell-offs and shut down that market from selling, should we have them in place. Thank you, Ron. ADA, ADB, circuit breakers to suspend the markets. The end of the New York Stock Exchange, the end of the regulation. I'm going right for the juggler on NASDAQ. Take your 15-minute break now, get your nourishment. And when you come back, I'm going to light it up. Scudder, Van Kempen, T. Rowe, Price, Fidelity, Magellan, and Dreyfus. Mutual fund trading. See you for Chapter 18. Thank you. You guys are sick over here. There's sneezing going on, and I think it's okay. If you give me the cold that I give to my children, I'm going to cut your heart out. <laughs>